Imagine creating an invention that is used by the majority of human beings on the planet each day, but only being remembered for designing perhaps the weirdest all-terrain vehicle ever tested. That's the story you're about to learn, which links a brilliant inventor named Ely Agnides to a bizarre vehicle called the Rhino and the truly interesting twists and turns along the way. Ely Agnides was born in Istanbul in 1901. He was born to Greek parents in what was then known as the Ottoman Empire. He came from a family of means, so they shipped him off to England for his primary education, and eventually he chose to attend college in Belgium at the University of Belgium. He received an engineering degree during that education. Agnides came from a family of accomplished people. He had siblings that were college professors, and his brother actually rose to become the Undersecretary of the United Nations. The Agnides family meant business. Understanding this background and his upbringing, as well as the success of his fellow family members, it seems only logical that Agnides would decide that working for other people was not going to be his path to success. Rather, he decided to employ his creative mind as an inventor. So, as a guy who has family money can do, he became an inventor full-time. And let's just say he chose the right career path. Agnides would have nearly 200 patents to his name by the time he finally pumped the brakes on his inventing career and lived a good life in his 80s. Most of his early work was in regard to fluid. He developed pumps, flow meters, coupling methods for fluid connectors, and other mechanical products, and this was all only a handful of years since he had gotten out of college. In fact, his first patent was awarded in 1927. It would be 1940, though, when Agnides would get the patent for a device you interact with multiple times a day and do not give a second thought to. The faucet aerator. As the story goes, he was sitting by a waterfall observing how the water was aerated while falling and how it reacted when it hit the rocks and other objects at the bottom of the falls. He surmised that if he could create the same effect out of a kitchen or bathroom faucet, it would have a big impact on some of the most basic and commonly performed acts in any home. And boy, was he right. By creating the simple aerating device, water no longer blasted out of a faucet and splashed everywhere it hit over a glass or a dish. Now filled with millions of bubbles, the water clung to those things. Furthermore, soap was activated far better and much less of it could be used to do the mundane jobs of washing those glasses and dishes in the sink. There were other oddball claims that were made of this device as well, like it made the water taste better, but the bottom line is that this invention worked for its intended purpose and the faucet aerator was something that would kind of, in a very small way, change the world. At first, the only way to affix an aerator was to use a rubber collar that you would slide up and over the neck of a faucet. As we know today, aerators are integrated into every single faucet sold around the world. Now, it wasn't an overnight success, as you might imagine. He had sold about 100,000 units before World War II, and it would be a handful of years after the war until things went totally crazy with sales volume, that number shot into the millions, his patent was licensed to huge companies, and suddenly, Ely Agnides was wealthy beyond his wildest dreams, and there was no foreseeable end to the income stream. But what if I told you that this invention, successful and profitable as it was, didn't actually begin to scratch the surface of Agnides' true passion project? Ely Agnides literally wanted to reinvent the wheel, and he had actually started this process in the early stages of World War II. Ely was in New York and one day found himself in Central Park. Now remember, this is the early 1940s. He was watching bulldozers work, and he kept coming back to the idea that the tracks they were on could be replaced with a much more efficient manner of propulsion, one that would give the same traction, but one that would allow for far better speeds, more efficient movement, and ultimately even more mobility. What he saw in his brain were hemispherical wheels, Imagine sawing a grapefruit in half and then using each of the halves as its own wheel. Being that World War II was breaking out all over the place, his first potential application, and the one he got his patent on just after the aerator, a tank. The concept was for a small single-man ball-shaped tank. The two hemispheres would be connected with a round center section. The driver would also be the gunner. Propulsion was to be provided by the hemispheres on the outside of the machine, powered by a gasoline engine. The ball tank was self-writing. In the event it was forced to roll over on its side, it was able to turn on its own axis, change direction instantly, and would also be made buoyant as the spine hemispherical wheels could power through water as well. The ball tank would be impervious to things like mud and snow and did not need flat terrain to simply go across. Now that said, there were deployable guide wheels that could be used to give stability over steep gradients. 
submitted to the Patent Office in 1942 and approved in 1945, no example of a ball tank outside of a small model here was ever created. A couple of similar-ish concepts were tested by armies all over the world, but none of them saw any sort of active duty beyond trials. The ball tank definitely got Agnides hooked on his dream of hemispherical wheel acceptance and superiority, though. As the post-war years saw his aerator begin to sell by the millions around the globe, Agnides was emboldened to do something that only truly obsessive rich guys do, see his own invention come to life. As he was hooked on the idea of this being used in the military, he needed to find a builder that could A, execute his vision, and B, get the attention of the armed forces to actually get the rig demonstrated and proven. In his own mind, once they actually saw his grand idea, no one would have any choice but to adopt it as brand new groundbreaking technology. And then, on January 1st, 1950, this news story appeared in the Indianapolis News. Headline, Marmon Harrington Building Amphibious Tank for Inventor by Roger Budrow. Quote, a revolutionary tank is being built in Indianapolis. Its inventor says it will operate on water or in the snow and ice-covered wastes of polar regions. The tank is under construction at Marmon Harrington, Inc., which has long-built military equipment, including the very light airborne tank towed across the English Channel to Normandy in the invasion gliders of World War II. The inventor is a Greek now living in this country, Ely P. Agnides, who is paying for the construction of this new tank. Agnides is also the inventor of a device installed on water faucets which injects air bubbles into the water. This is done to make the water taste better, looks clearer, keeps from splashing, allows soap to lather more quickly, and other benefits. He gets a large income from that sale of the gadget. To enable the tank to go through water, a new means of locomotion is used, Agnides said. It does not have the usual treads, and he plans to show the completed tank to Army officials. End quote. In 1951, this photo appeared in newspapers across the country, showing Agnides on the left and a device called the Sun Valley Roller that he had invented apparently as an alternative way to enjoy the slopes if you didn't know how to ski. That all sounds good on paper, but we think this was more of an experimentation regarding the use of the hemispherical wheels on different surfaces. This look at the snow performance is interesting because I don't know if this thing had an engine, if it was simply a downhill roller, or what exactly was gleaned from the research. I do know that maybe outside of this single example, no one has ever seen a machine like this at a ski slope in their life, so let's just say that wasn't exactly a mass market appeal product. So during this same period where Marmon Harrington is scratch building Agnide's vision into a reality, he was doing what most successful investors have to do all the time, defending patents. Agnides was very quick to sue anyone who he thought was infringing on the aerator, and more often than not, he won, and he won pretty big. With a device with such potential massive audience, the aerator wars were on, and Ely's legal team was not only fighting on the front line, they were making themselves and him a bunch of money in the process. In 1954, Agnide's design and vision was actually brought out to physical form by Marmon Harrington. The vehicle is one of the most bizarre-looking functional machines created in the 20th century, and it was met with a very interesting reception. On August 26, 1954, the world opened their newspapers to see this Associated Press story entitled, Balls Replace Wheels on Five-Ton Monster, Associated Press, Dateline, Indianapolis, August 26, 1954. Quote, The man who took the splash out of the kitchen sink unveiled a grotesque five-ton vehicle today that can roll like a ball through a swamp. The inventor, Ely P. Agnides, used the ball principle to move his mechanical monster through mud and sand. But the first model can speed 45 miles an hour over highways. It can even ford streams and churn onto a lake. Agnides called it the Rhino. The new vehicle was given its first public test here today, and Agnides called it the greatest advance in the wheel in a thousand years. The Rhino's most novel feature is its spun aluminum wheels, which look like halves of huge balls. Set at slight angles to the massive chassis, they provide traction to uneven terrain, can climb up to a 65% grade, and tip at an angle of 75 degrees without flipping over. Rubber treads near the rim permit the 45-mile-an-hour highway speed with only a 110-horsepower Ford engine. Engineers of Marmon Harrington Company, who have been building and testing the Rhino since 1949, believe the highway speed can be increased to 80 miles per hour with a bigger engine. A hydrojet unit provides the power when the Rhino takes to the deep water, but the present water speed is only 5 miles an hour. Agnides, a 48-year-old New York inventor born to Greek parents in Constantinople, thinks his Rhino is the successor to slow-moving tanks and tractors with clanking treads that cut up roads. Agnides has been best known for his water faucet gadget, 
which mixes air into the stream of water to eliminate splashing in kitchen sinks. End quote. As awkward, ghastly, and weird as the rhino looks, it worked really, really well. The private testing done with both Agnides and Marmon Harrington showed the machine performed pretty much flawlessly in mud, water, dry land, and more. Agnides' theories out of the positive properties of the hemispherical wheels were dead on. The more they dug into a soft surface, the more bite they got as there was more surface area clawing into the ground. Also, the inherent stability they provided was incredible. While it looks like the rhino could tip over in a stiff wind, it was actually capable of being up to 75 degrees on its side and not going turtle. The specs? It weighed about 10,000 pounds, it was 19 feet long, 9 feet wide, and about 10 feet tall. The 6-foot tall wheels and bug-eye lights in the front with the oddly shaped torso of the machine made some call it the polywog. Power was from a 110-horsepower Ford engine, which I believe to be a flathead V8. All the elements combined together allowed this thing to be the strangest-looking self-propelled vehicle anyone had ever laid eyes on or possibly would ever see. The rear wheels steered the machine. It was capable of going 45 miles an hour, which, with rear wheel steering, was likely terrifying, and the Rhino could be run in either two- or four-wheel drive, as the transfer case could be engaged or disengaged at the care of the operator. In the water, it wasn't just the big wheels providing motion, there was an actual water jet system to help shove the thing along, and yeah, the top speed was a measly 5 miles an hour, but this was just a prototype and there'd be plenty of development work yet to do. The biggest thing that the Rhino had full mastery of was the often seemingly impossible transition from water to land. Even amphibious tanks could and would struggle with this terrain change, but the Rhino didn't care. It would do it in any sort of surface, in any sort of muck and mire, and even over rough terrain as well. A publicity blitz was put on the machine and it was featured in papers, magazines, newsreels, company promotional videos, and more. As ridiculous looking as this thing was, it worked, and Agnides knew he had something the military needed. Until they didn't. The military had issue with one thing, the one thing that Agnides thought was the strongest attribute of the whole program, his beloved wheels. A tank's tracks, as cantankerous, complicated, and ground-wrecking as they may be, have a lot of strength and resiliency. These giant spun aluminum wheels would be in danger of even serious small arms fire, they thought, let alone a more heavy weapon fired at this machine. They saw promise in the amphibian characteristics of the Rhino, but they just didn't see it as a viable option to be added to the military fleet of the United States. Undaunted, Agnides and Marmon Harrington shopped this baby to anybody who would listen but nobody wanted anything to do with the Rhino. After all the big splash of the introduction, after all the money Agnides had spent, and after all the successful trials, the Rhino was stuffed in the back corner of the Marmon Harrington plant and forgotten. More on that in a minute. But there was some actual good news. Agnides was still making money at an astronomical rate, and this dream of his hemispherical wheels wouldn't die with the Rhino. In 1956, Agnides reappeared with the media with a vehicle called the Baby Rhino. Now, this was designed as a remote control scale model to be demonstrated, and it was going to be an open vehicle capable of carrying men and supplies over any terrain, over water, and using four huge canted hemispherical wheels. Unfortunately, outside of the remote control version, nothing ever came of this idea either. There was one final gasp on this front, though. Agnides received a patent on a vehicle that used two of his massive wheels in line to support and power the vehicle. After getting the patent, he went to his partners at Marmon Harrington and signed a contract for them to once again bring his vision to life. This wild vehicle would be called the Cyclops. Unlike the Rhino Project, this did not go well. In 1966, the companies became entangled in a lawsuit that would go on for six years, being settled in 1972 after various appeals and wrangling. Agnides claimed that Marmon Harrington didn't live up to their end of the bargain and delivered a prototype that was non-functional from the jump, and one that they knew, as they were taking his money for years, would never actually work. After all was said and done, Agnides won in court, receiving $120,000 in 1972, which is just about $900,000 today, another solid court win for our man Agnides. It is at this point where the story really takes a turn for the weird. His name showed up in the November 25, 1973 New York Daily News under this headline and this insane story. Headline Six-foot female ghostwriter wafts out with $100,000 icon by Philip McCarthy and Paul Meskel. Quote, a 70-year-old art collector and inventor was drugged by a tall, dark woman who then walked out of his Hotel Pierre suite 
for the 15th century icon valued at $100,000, police reported yesterday. Victim of the city's latest and most unusual art theft was wealthy Ely P. Agnides, who had lived in the Super Swank Pierre Hotel for five years. Agnides, who is well-known in local and international art circles, recently advertised for a ghostwriter to help compile his memoir. The woman who answered his ad, the detective said, was more Amazon than Phantom. Subtitle, a six-footer, 35. She was described as six feet tall, 160 pounds, 35 to 40 years old, of swarthy complexion, with dark brown hair and brown eyes. She was wearing contact lenses and a loose-fitting beige raincoat, Agnides told police. Detectives said Agnides made an appointment to meet the woman for lunch Friday in an east side restaurant. Then they went to his art line suite to discuss his writing project. He and the woman had a drink around 4 p.m. Shortly thereafter, he became ill and fell asleep. Police believe that the woman spiked his drink with knockout drops. Subtitle, Wallet Also Gone. When he awoke yesterday morning, he checked the apartment and discovered the loss of the icon, which depicted the Annunciation. Also missing were two watches valued at $500, a $50 ring, and his wallet containing $300 cash. Agnides reported the robbery to hotel officials who notified police. Detectives said Agnides owned patents on several inventions, including a water aerating device. End quote. Now, this case was apparently never solved because it never appeared in the newspaper again, and it was never spoken of again in Agnides life. But that weird incident aside, I'm happy to report a couple of things. Firstly, Ely Agnides, despite his obsession with weird wheels, didn't go broke or lose everything as so many do. He kept right on inventing, and believe it or not, he scored another massive financial bonanza at the age of 80 when he was granted the U.S. patent for a showerhead with means of selecting various forms of output stream. Yep, that showerhead you see in virtually every hotel room you've ever been in, or many people have in their homes, the type you can rotate and select the water stream you want, he invented that too. Agnides licensed the design and was making huge profits off it right up until his death in 1988 at the ripe old age of 87. Ely Agnides had an amazing life, one that was pretty well lived and one that continues to quite literally touch people worldwide on a daily basis. So what happened to the rhino? Believe it or not, the rhino still exists in running and driving form. It was left in the Indianapolis plant, then moved to another location, and when that location was being demolished, it was saved by a guy named Eugene Pock. And as you can see here, Pock would bring it to tractor and farm shows and cruise it around to let people see the machine in person, and it is absolutely amazing that this really strange, odd-looking, but really functional concept has survived all these years. That's the story of the rhino. A weird idea from a brilliant mind, a fat wallet, and the hands of skilled craftsmen at Marmon Harrington. Sometimes even when stuff does work to the degree a designer thought it would, it still doesn't cut the mustard in the end. Ely Agnides led an amazing life. And the rhino? The rhino is my absolute favorite part of it. Like and subscribe for more automotive and historic content.